I'd like everybody to go with me to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Have your Bibles today because we're going to do a little Bible thumping today. Amen. Everybody with a Bible. Hallelujah. Matthew 24. And go with me down to verse number four. And I'll be reading from four to 13. I am in Matthew, the 24th chapter, verses four down to 13. And it reads as follows. And Jesus answered and said unto them, take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars and see that ye be not troubled for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But somebody say, but. But he or she that shall endure unto the end, it said the same shall be what? Shall be saved. Hallelujah. Bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, I ask right now in the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, that you would fill this place in a magnificent way and that you would begin to touch the hearts of your sons and daughters. Open up their minds and their hearts to receive the word today. Father, I decrease so you can increase. Let the word go forth with power and with strength to bring change. Heavenly Father, I ask you to anoint your word today in the mighty name of Jesus and make each and every one here defenders of their faith. I ask this now in the name of Jesus, and they all say it, amen. You may be seated. Now, Matthew 24 is, is really happening in our world today would you all agree we're seeing it and I was looking nation against nation and and we see how Russia went into Ukraine and they're talking about I believe China trying to take over Taiwan and and then it says kingdom against kingdom and I said you know what God's kingdom and the devil's kingdom are at war hallelujah and we need to recognize what time it is that we're living in so that we can defend the faith and stay strong. Now, my question I asked is, did you switch sides? I want to talk about the word apostasy today. Being uh, uh, an apostate. So you may not have heard that word, but apostasy. And you say, well, what is apostasy? Apostasy is the act of refusing to continue to follow, obey, or recognize your Christian faith. It means that you abandon or you rebel or you renounce the truth that you once knew. It also means, if I can put it in a little nutshell, it means you defect. You were once loyal, and then you defect to the other side. Now, it's something about apostasy or a person becoming an apostate is that we can, we can see many things going on. Many of us have suffered losses, and we believe for certain things, and those things just didn't happen. And then what happens is our faith 
gets challenged. And then you begin to start asking yourself the question, does it really work? But it works. The word of God is true and faithful and it works. Now in Hebrew 3 and verse number 12, it says, take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief, come on now, in departing from the living God. So this war that's going on is constantly trying to get the Christian, the believer, to depart from God. Everything that's going on in the world, tell me what is pushing you to God. Not much. Mostly everything we see is trying to move us. Now, in Hebrews 3 and 12, in the Amplified Version, it says, Take care, brothers and sisters, that there not be in any one of you a wicked and unbelieving heart. So to unbelieve, the Bible says, it's wicked. So when you don't trust and when you don't believe God, the scripture says, it's an evil heart. So we need to take care, he says. And then he says, listen, because... When you have an unbelieving heart, it means you refuse to trust and rely on the Lord. And then you turn away from him. This is why we see such a great falling away. This is why we see so many that don't care if they come to church or not. I recently had an individual tell me that they no longer believe in structured worship service. And so I said to them, <laughs> you've been deceived. You once believed in structured worship, and now you no longer believe. You've defected. Well, what is an apostate not? As I go further, I want you to understand what it's not. Because I don't want you going around picking and saying to people, are you an apostate? Are you an apostate? No, that's not what this is about. But what an apostate is not is a non-Christian or a backslider. An apostate is not a struggling Christian either. But an apostate is someone that has been actively involved, visibly, listen to this, this is so good. An apostate is a person that has been actively in the visible church community serving and then they willfully leave the church and refute or reject their truth. They walk away from God, their faith, and their divine leadership. Oh, stay with me. Hebrews, in the 10th chapter, in verse 26 and 27, he said, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, he said, there is no longer a sacrifice that can cover your sins. But only the terrible expectation of God's judgment and the raging fire that will consume his enemy. So whether or not preachers are preaching, somebody turn to somebody and say, hell is still real. See, we don't want to believe that there is a place of fire and brimstone. But if you desert, if you depart from the faith of the living God... There is a hellfire waiting for you. Well, I was wondering what caused the great apostasy. And they declared that it happened because people began to reject and try to change the pure truth that Jesus and his disciples had established. So you always got people coming in that want to change or twist or make it fit or suitable for their lifestyle. 
We're not to take the word and make it suitable for our lifestyle. We're supposed to take the word and follow it. Apply it to our life. Not make it convenient for you to do whatever it is you want to do when you want to do it. Is anybody in here with me? Now, Paul, and I want to show us something. Uh, go to Philemon 1 and 24. Philemon, I know that's not where we usually go, but I want to show you something. And Philemon 1 and 24. Now, Paul is giving some instruction to Timothy about to uh, some individuals, and he's, well, let me backtrack, because I don't want to get ahead of myself. Right now, Paul is in probably one of the most critical places in his life, and he's up for a trial, and he's alone, and I would say that Paul needed the disciples and his brethren Listen, there are some of us that are going through some things where we need one another. And we're not there for one another because we are self-consumed and we have our own things going on. But God wants the body of Christ to come together and be there. When my brother or my sister bleeds, I ought to be there with the band-aid to say it's going to be all right. But because many of us are so afraid one, to let people know, I don't know why I got to say this, but to let people know that we're hurting, we won't even speak to anybody. We'll just go and suffer through when we have the body of Christ that is here supposed to uh, care and love and show kindness and encourage one another. We got to start trusting one another because we need to recognize we're in a battle and the battle is not between us. It is between the enemy. We're treating our brothers and sisters like they're the enemy. So in Philemon 1 and 24, and it says, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas are my fellow laborers. Is that what it says? So we see in there this name, Demas, is that right? So that means, he said, Demas is visibly working with Paul. He said, he's a fellow laborer with me. Now go over to Colossians 4. I just want to show you some 4 and 14. Go to Colossians. So this tells me, listen. We need to stop being surprised that we have brothers and sisters that have worked in the faith with us and then they leave and you are startled. Oh, come on. I hope the sister won't mind. I'm not going to call her name, but she didn't know she was right in my message and she asked me a question. She said, how does a person that is so faithful and, um, and, and serving and attendance just walk away? But we're seeing it in this day and age. And we need to understand that people are beginning to become apostates. They're switching sides on us. Their philosophies and their beliefs are changing rapidly. And here we have the body of born-again believers that don't want to defend the faith. Won't even share your faith. Some people in your community, on your job, wherever you hang out, they don't even know you are Christian. Colossians 4, in verse number 14. It said, Luke, the beloved physician... And Demas greets you. So I took us to those two verses to let us recognize that Demas was not some fair weather brother in the Lord that came and, and left. But Demas was with Paul, laboring hard on the missionary journeys. You may have some brothers and sisters that have been working hard with you for the kingdom. And now you look to your side and they ain't there no more. Now, 2 Timothy, this is where it really gets serious. 
Go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, I am talking about an apostate, a person that has been actively visible in the church and in the community serving. And then they willfully, it wasn't because they was pushed out. It wasn't because they, somebody did something. They willfully made a decision to leave and reject their faith. Don't you walk away from God in this hour. You better learn the gravity of the hour. Now's not the time to, to play church. How about this? Now's not the time to even pretend to be a believer. It's time for us to be the real deal. Now, 2 Timothy 4 and 10, this is good. It says, for Demas have forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Cretans to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. Oh, my. This same Demas that was a fellow laborer with me, this same Demas that sends greetings to the church has now left Paul. He said he forsook me. In other words, at a time when I needed him the most, he ran out on me. Who have you ran out on in a most critical time of their need? He said he, he forsook me, but he didn't just forsake me. His reasoning was that he loved the world more than he loved God. You got to be careful when you love the world and the things in the world more than you love the king of glory. The one that died and rose again for your salvation. You love the world. Well, well, I looked up and I said, okay, well, if he loved the world more than he loved doing the work of the Lord, what was in Thessalonica? So it says that Thessalonica was like a hub or a trade port. And it said it was a wealthy city. It had a diverse population of Romans, Greeks, and Jews. It, was, it had a vibrant nightlife. <laughs> uh, is anybody in here with me? So it said he forsook Paul because he loved the present world. Now, let's look at this. When you start loving the values and the pleasures of the world more than the pleasures of God, something is going on inside of your heart. I ask myself the question, how, how can you tell if a person is an apostrate? Well, the Bible tells us that you'll know them by the fruit that they produce. Now, I don't know what kind of fruit Demas was producing or not producing, but listen to me. This is the tricky part about being an apostate is that because they're visibly working in the church and serving and, and being with you and they buddy-buddy with you, you can't really tell. So it's not for us to decipher if they are or they aren't. But what's the key? God knows. See, when you come into your Christendom, when you are born again, and if there is no nature change in you, no characteristic change in your life, though you have accepted Christ, something is wrong. So that means if I can use my, my imagination Demas probably was working in the Lord and helping and, and everything, but deep down in his heart, he had a desire for lustful, worldly things. Say, Lord, I need you to get this out of me. So much so that it drove him to leave 
his brethren at a critical state. Oh, Bishop and I have experienced this in, in, in real life. We just didn't know it was apostasy. We were at a critical moment of purchasing this building. We were headed to the bank Monday morning. It needed to be three of us. We had a member that was supposed to be with us. And at the very last hour, before our meeting, decided to leave. So we had to go in by faith, knowing that it's God's will, and here we are. We know that God worked it out. But can you imagine how we felt at the hour, the, the last minute? See, some of y'all don't have people leave you at critical mass and betray you. And it's not an easy thing. But that's where your trust and reliance comes in on God and not a person. See, too many of us are trusting people instead of relying on God. Now, this is the thing I notice about an apostate. When they leave, they don't care who they hurt. Oh, no, nobody don't want to be real with me today. Can I be real and talk real talk with you all? I've seen where teachers have walked out and left their class. And I've seen, oh, I'm talking about me, the hurt and the woundedness on the kids when they came to me and Bishop and said, where's our teacher? Broke our hearts. See, this is too heavy because it's too real. And then we have to run interference and get somebody else to step in. You need to recognize that each and every one of you here today, you're important in the vision. You are important in the plan of God. And every one of us has a work to do. Will you surrender your gifts to the Lord? So Demas left him. Paul is alone, but he's never really alone because God is with him. Now, I want to add something. The first situation I told you of with the bank, that member after years has since come back to me and Bishop and asked our forgiveness. I don't want to leave that out. And then we were able to forgive one another and reconnect. See, only a God does that. Now, let me ask you this. There are steps that move people to becoming an apostate. The first one is, is that you find fault with your bishop, your pastor, and your leaders in the church and you no longer hold them in high esteem or regard. And you'll know it's so when you hear them making comments like, they ain't no different than me. Yes, they are. God anointed them to lead. You'll hear them make uh, comments. Uh, they don't know what they doing. Then pray for them. In every church... You ought to be able to highly regard and have esteem for your leadership. Because they are God's delegated authority to help you to get to glory. They are there to help you to understand the word and how to walk out the Christian life. But see, an apostate person says, uh, I got to find fault. And they nitpick the bishop, at the pastor, the evangelist, the teacher, the prophet, they nitpick at them so that they can minimize their authority in God's house. Are you moving in steps toward becoming an apostate? Do you oftentimes find yourself seeking to find fault? I like what... <laughs> 
Brother Paul said as we were praying, he said we need to forgive and stop, stop blaming and finding fault on everybody. We just need to learn how to forgive. Turn to somebody and say, you need to learn how to let it go. Say, let it go. Now, another thing about becoming an apostate is that they live a life that has a failure in it to repent. They can know that they are living a sinful lifestyle or doing wrong, but yet they will refuse to ask God to forgive them. So they, they live a lifestyle of lacking to repent. We need to repent often if you're doing something often. But they've got into such a place of arrogance and pride, they don't think they need to repent or ask forgiveness for nothing. Remember what I said. An apostate is a person that's actively in church with you. <laughs> working and serving but they have willfully in their heart already decided to leave the faith they no longer believe what they once used to believe you know have any of you ever experienced where you prayed for somebody and you prayed hard for somebody that was ill and then they died and you gave every bit of effort you had but what we need to recognize is that we are not the healer. God is. I don't determine life or death. But yet when that thing happened, you begin to question the word of God that says God is a healer. You begin to question what you once believed. You believed in healing, but once that person died, now you're challenged of whether or not you're going to continue in the faith and to believe. Another thing that an apostate individual or person does is that they stay offended and bitter all the time, especially when they are posed with truth. They refuse to let go of anything in this life. So an apostate person is a person that is embittered and offended, easily offended. Somebody could say, you look good today. Well, why you say that? I don't look good other days. I'm talking about the apostate. And then this last one. Now, an apostate person has a deep-seated root of refusing to submit and follow truth. They're self-willed. Don't tell me what to do. I don't got to follow the Bible. I don't, I don't like what it says. It says, sanctify yourself and be holy, for I am holy, thus saith the Lord God of heaven. What? You know that bit of uh, stubbornness in you? That when truth taps on it, you rear up like a, a roaring, vicious dog. Ah! I don't know if anybody in here with me, but I want y'all to understand that we are living in a time of a great falling away of true believers. And then I asked the question, were they really true believers? Now, there are churches that are operating in apostasy. And we need to recognize because we're seeing it all on Facebook, YouTube. Some of us may have even attended their services. And we're wondering what in the world is going on. We've seen them where the culture and the, the worldly things have made its way into the church. And now nothing is holy anymore. Everybody is compromising. It talks about in 2 Peter 2 and 18. It said one thing about a church of apostasy. It said they speak swelling words. 
Let's go there. Second Peter 2 18. It says, for when they speak great swelling words of vanity, it said they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escape from them who live in error. Let me read it to you in the New Living Translation. It might help you a little bit better. So a church that's filled with apostasy, it said they talk these great swelling words. They want to draw you in by your lust. They want to draw you in by, by things that um, are reckless and lacking. It says, listen to this. It said they brag about themselves with empty, foolish boasting. Listen, when you start hearing the man of God or the woman of God talking about, look what I've done, look who I am, you need to beware. Listen, the only star in the kingdom of God is Jesus Christ who died and rose again for our sins. Hallelujah. It is not a man. It is not a woman. But we got so many people now that are worshiping men and women of God when they need to be worshiping God and God alone. Turn to somebody and say, you better keep your focus. He said in 2 Peter 2.18, he said, they brag about themselves with empty, foolish boasting, with an appeal of twisted sexual desires. Come on, you got to know that God made marriage for you to enjoy the pleasures of sex. He did not make it for you to be out there fornicating, sleeping around with any and every one. He said he twists them up with their sexual desires. What do they call it? Troples? I don't know. Somebody know what I'm talking about. Threesomes. Orgies. We just recently heard freak parties. Just by the name, you should have already knew what was going on. See, we're getting twisted up. In things that are not righteous. And we're downplaying and we're minimizing them like we say it ain't that bad. If I want to sleep with five men, I can. I want three, three women. I have my wife and two more. Oh, yeah. See, it's time for the church to get clean because it said kingdom against kingdom. Light and darkness are at it with one another. And the church needs to shine bright. We need to be able to draw people into God. But we cannot draw them unto the Lord if we look just like the world. So it said they have a, an appeal with twisted sexual desires. And listen to this. It said they lure them back into sin, those who barely escaped from the lifestyle of deception. You barely got out yourself. And he said, listen, they're speaking all these swelling words, words to you, and they're pulling you right back to a place or a condition of ungodliness. You know, there's a verse in 2 Peter 2 and 21, and it talks about, how that the dog, it, it used to disturb me. I said, God, what kind of verse is this where it says that the dog returns to his vomit and then it says the pig returns back to his mud. The pig gets cleaned up and then it goes back and wallows in the mud. I dare you to come into God and let him wash you with his blood and then go back out in the world and let it muddy you all up. Said the dog going Eat his own vomit. If you can get a sight of that. A born again believer who's been washed in the powerful blood of Jesus, been cleansed from head to toe, serving God, worshiping God, praying to God, reading his word, and loving and sharing, go back out and eat up his vomit and wallow in the mud. I'm talking about churches. 
filled with swelling words, apostasy churches. Another thing about an apostasy church, I just want to warn you all of what you're looking at. Nobody told me about apostasy, even though I was experiencing it already in my Christian walk. I just didn't have a label on it. It said that these kind of churches, they are man-centered and not Christ-centered. The Bible says in Romans 12 and 3, he said, For I say through the grace given unto me that every man and woman among you not to think of him or herself more highly than they ought to think, but to think soberly according as God has dealt to them every measure of faith. This is the word of God. He said, be careful when you think that you are so much better than everybody else. Think, think carefully when you put down the man on the street or the woman on the street begging for a penny. Be careful. We are the body of Christ. We are to share, to love, and to help one another. He said, churches are filled with self-love. And conceit. They're man-centered. And not God-centered. When you come in to worship. I was watching a, I was watching a service. And don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about just a gospel concert. Because we had one. But I'm talking about when you come in. To your church service. And it's like a concert. unto man and no worship going up to God we got it twisted we have had the thrills of the lights and the, the roaming ball and spinning but wait a minute if we do all this and God gets no glory no honor and worship we are falling away from the truth See, we've fallen away, and many of us don't even know we're slipping. So now we're into the glit and the glamour, and we forgot the blood of Jesus that has set us free. We're living in perilous times. Another thing about a church of apostasy is that they call darkness light, and they call light darkness. Isaiah penned it in 5 and 20. He said, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. And that they put darkness for light and light for darkness. He said, listen, there is not a distinction between sanctified and the world. He said, there is a distinction between bitter and sweet and sweet and bitter. We're getting it mixed up now. We're calling things, listen, God said that marriage is between a man and a woman. Now we say a man and a man or a woman and woman. Listen, man can make all kind of laws, but it is not the law of God Almighty. And many of you are working around people where you can't even defend the faith no more. When you do it, you're scared. Well, listen, we cannot be scared to proclaim the truth of the gospel. Do I have anybody in here that's not afraid to tell the truth and to declare what they believe in? Calling light darkness. <laughs> Calling evil good. And and proud of it, they're falling away. Another thing about a church of apostasy is that they refuse to preach the truth for fear of what's going to happen to them. You know, preachers have gotten put in jail for the truth. Missionaries have been killed for speaking the truth. What price have you paid? To speak the truth to somebody. It says in the world, listen, there's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. 
But at the end of that verse, he said, is not of the father. In other words, he said, this has nothing to do with God. He said, but it is of the world. I want to encourage you to come out of the world. We can be in the world, but not of the world. I want to encourage you and exhort you to live a godly life, to begin to lay down those lustful desires, those fleshly things that keep blocking your relationship with God. That's why you say stuff like, I don't feel him. God is holy. You keep trying to downplay ungodliness and make it comfortable for you, even though you know the truth. Be careful. You might be moving in steps to become an apostate. A person that once knew the truth. The Bible says it is better not to have known the truth than to know the truth and to walk away from it. And if I'm getting that correct, he's saying it's better that you was just a sinner than to come into the church and learn of me and then walk away. The Bible says that the fear of man is a snare. But whosoever will put their trust in the Lord, he said, you will be safe. You know, it's a hazard <laughs> to fall away. <laughs> That's a hazard. Because you might wind up in fire and brimstone. <laughs> See, society does not have a standard of righteousness. Only God's laws do. And so as a believer, you are posed with the question of who you going to follow. Who are you going to live your life according to? And this is nothing new because we've been crying loud and we've been sharing. Come out. Come out. The time is near. The time is close. And you still saying in your heart, I still got enough time to do my thing. Can you go with me over to Romans the first chapter. Am I good? Yes. Romans 1. Go down to verse number 28. Because, see, we're living in a time where people are giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, and they're following all manner of things. But look what Romans 1, 28 down to 32 says. Can I read it to you? And I, I believe that I want to read it in the New Living Translation because many, many of us, uh, you still playing church. How long you going to keep playing church? Oh, God, I love you. But you won't do nothing, he says. I'm not here to condemn you. I'm here to encourage you to do better. I'm here to encourage you to recognize that we are in end times and there is a kingdom war going on and there are people that are lost that need a savior and you are the remnant to go out there and to draw them to Jesus Christ and let them know that there is hope in God. I need some people that won't bow. I need some people that won't cower out. You was the baddest thing ever when you was in the street and you get in God and you become a coward. You won't open your mouth. It says, Lord, what does the wine and say? How will they know unless we tell it? How are people going to know that Jesus died for them and that Jesus wants them to live an abundant life unless we tell it? But you worried about you and your thing. Can I read Romans 1, 28 down to 32? 
It says, since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking. I'm in the New Living Translation. And let them do things that should never be done. You've been doing some stuff you know you have never done before. And then inside of your heart, it's just pricking you and, and trying to prod you. The Holy Ghost is like, daughter, son, don't cut it out. 29. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. This is what's happening around us. In 30, he said, they are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. He said, they even invent new ways of sinning, and they disobey their parents. I'm talking about a falling away. I'm talking about a people that is doing so much that it's drawing, it's drawing them away from God. 31, he said they refuse to understand. You ever talk to somebody, no matter how you curve it, cut it, slice it, dice it, they still will look at you and say, I don't get it. They refuse to understand the truth of the gospel, that Jesus has come to make your life better and not worse. He's come to give you a hope. He's come to fill you with love and care one for another. People are falling away. That was once active. Sit in the chair next to you. And you looking surprised. I forgot to tell you that one thing about an apostate the only way you really can tell is to know their heart. And you know what the last indicator is that they were an apostate? Is that they leave. And the Bible says that if they were truly of us, they would still be with us and they would not have left us. So while you're looking, maybe because you didn't see what was going on in the heart of that person, and the only reason that you know now what was in the heart is because they left. Whose side are you on? Did you switch sides? You was once loving God, and now you love the devil and all of his pleasures? It said in 32, well, let me finish 31. They refuse to understand. They break their promises. They are heartless, and they have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die. Yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage other people to do it with them. So you're going to go out and do your thing, but you're not going to do it alone. You're going to pull all your friends and buddies to do it with you, even though you know that it ain't right. Oh, I know y'all don't like this message today, but it's all right. It's the truth anyhow. And he wants us to come out and to be a shining light. He wants us to be that light on top of a hill, declaring that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Have you walked away from your own steadfastness? How do I avoid becoming an apostate? Well, I avoid it by defending my faith. I avoid it by putting my trust and my reliance in God and God alone. Well, how do I avoid being a, an apostate? I learn how to overcome offenses. And I stop staying mad all the time. I start releasing things. How 
how do I avoid becoming an apostate? I do not leave my sin unchecked. Stop leaving your sin unchecked in your life and begin to repent and ask God's forgiveness. How do I avoid becoming an apostate? I stop fault finding. I eliminate it from my life. I say, okay, I'm going to just lift them up in prayer. But I think one of the greatest ways to avoid being an apostate is to have a pure heart that is filled with love. When you got a pure heart that's filled with love, you're going to care about everybody. And you're going to love God and want to please God. We have to keep preaching the truth. Now, I want to read this verse to you, and I'm winding down, in 2 Peter 3 and 17. It says, you already know all these things, dear friends, so be on the guard. This is the New Living Translation. Then you will not be carried away with the errors of these wicked people and lose your own secure footing. See, we're not, we not being aware. You got to be aware. You got to be conscious of what's going on around you. You got to be conscious of what you're engaging in and how that it might be offending your God whom you say you love. He said, be on the guard. Too many of us got our guards down. He said, when your guard is down, you can get carried away with all manner of wickedness. And then he said, you'll lose your secure footing. Remember what I said. Have you lost your steadfastness? Hold true to God. God is faithful. God won't disappoint or let you down. God loves us so much. Despite how the world may respond to us, stay the course. Be steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Get your footing back, saints. Get your footing back and stand. He said, after you've done all, again I say stand. I need some people that know how to stand through the storm. It may bend you back and forth, but bounce back up and say, for God I'll live and for God I'll die. I will not be moved. You got to tell that devil, I'm not bowing. Elijah was depressed and, and, and whining to God that everybody had left him. And he said, wait a minute here. He said, I got over 7,000 men that haven't bowed to Baal. Don't you ever think you're the only one in this gospel fight. Huh? It's some fighters out there that's standing for truth. Hallelujah. How many people going to stand for righteousness? Going to stand for truth? Uh, going to speak with some Holy Ghost boldness uh, and not be afraid? Uh, turn to somebody and say, you ain't no coward, are you? <laughs> you say, you already know this stuff. It's not nothing new. You're just losing your footing. Because you're concerned about just yourself. It's time for you to be concerned about other people. They need God. They need to know that there is hope in this world despite all the wickedness and evil that they see. I want you to recognize something. That there are two opposing forces that want your influence that really wants to influence you. And right now I want to say is Christ or culture. See, a culture is something that is learned, shared, and then adapted to. 
But Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life for all mankind. See, culture is beating people up right now because we all want to fit in. Stop seeking out the followers and become a follower of Christ. Stop seeking out the likes. Keep putting all these pictures on your social page of people that like you that don't even know you. Does that really make good sense? And the very people around you, you don't even talk to. See, we're caught up in this cultural thing. And we're not realizing it's, it's hurting us. Now, I'm not against technology. There's good in it as well. But when you can't go a day without seeing how many people liked your post, you're being driven by something that really is not going to bring you a great reward. Culture says, marry whoever you love. Christ says, marriage is between a man and a woman. Culture says you can be gender neutral. Christ says I created male and female. Culture says you can come to church and have a performance. Christ says come to church and worship me. Culture says build a large church. Christ says build my disciples. Culture says you can hate who you want to hate. Christ says, I want you to love everybody. I want you to take a moment and check your heart right now. Have you moved from your steadfastness in God? If you have, I want you to ask him to forgive you. He says in Hebrews 12 and 28, and this is my last scripture, because I love the word, because the word is what frees us, heals and delivers us. He said, wherefore we receive in a kingdom which cannot be moved. This is Hebrews 12 in verse 28. He says, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. You want to know how to serve God? He said, with reverence and godly fear. I want you to look to heaven right now. Dear gracious and heavenly Father, I ask that the word that has been spoken today would download into their hearts. Father, I ask that you would bring about change in their lives from this day forward. Lord God, I ask you to have your way in their lives. Show them their divine purpose. Lead and guide them as they make decisions. I ask this in the name of Jesus, that they would no longer call evil good, but that good would be good. Oh, Father, I ask you right now, stir up the gifts in them. Let them keep on loving, keep on inviting, keep on giving, keep on sharing in Christ. I ask this in Jesus' mighty name, and we bless you. Come on and give the Lord a praise. Come on, hallelujah. Hallelujah.